The Darker Side of History Hey Crash, today we're going to be talking about a few things that occurred in history. More specifically, we'll be taking a look at the dark stuff, the chilling stuff, the unsettling stuff, the- We get it, shut up, okay? For this video, we'll be viewing some short form video clips provided by our friends over at Interesting Shit. Whoa, holy fuck culture, you swore! I've said shit before, remember? In the sensitivity rant? Ah, oh, that's right, I did that without you. And what a wonderful time it was. How? How could I miss this? Your first curse word is arguably more momentous than your first ever word. It's like riding a bike without the training wheels for the first time. It's like losing your fucking virginity culture. I'd like to get on with this video, by the way, if, you know, that's okay with you. <laughs> they grow up so fast. We've got five different clips to view today, the first of which is titled Residential Schools and Genocide in Canada. I'm calling bullshit already. Genocide in Canada? The most polite and respectful place on planet Earth? You really shouldn't read so much into useless, doubtful stereotypes, buddy. Let's get this video started. There's a devastating story of cultural genocide that happened in Canada. And most Canadians aren't even aware of it. Starting in the 1880s and lasting as late as 1996, over 150,000 First Nations children between the ages of 4 and 16 were sent to faraway boarding schools called residential schools. The Canadian government intended to civilize the Indian and assimilate them into the dominant culture. Wh what? Canada was a bigot? Settle down, Crash. Almost every country has a dark underbelly of some sort regarding its past. I wouldn't get too worked up over it. Kids spent 10 months each year away from their families and traditions, learning to speak English and getting punished for speaking their own language. Living conditions at the school were sometimes terrible, and many of the children were physically and sexually abused. Over 6,000 children died attending the schools, mostly from tuberculosis. Others died of exposure, trying to escape. The last residential school closed in 1996. People in Canada are just now starting to learn about the abuse. Jeez, when you said dark, you really meant dark. Do we really have to watch the other four videos? The past happened whether you want to believe it or not, so why not use it to better ourselves? The first step is educating ourselves, which is exactly what we're doing today. Fuck off, since when have I ever wanted to be a better person? Good point. Anyway, the next one is called Tragedy, Hope, and the Thousand Paper Cranes. At least the word hope is there. Sadako Sasake, Tragedy, Hope, and a Thousand Paper Cranes. On August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima in Japan. Sadako Sasuke, aged two, and her parents miraculously survived the explosion. Side effects of the bomb's radiation caused an increase in leukemia cases in Japan. By January of 1955, at the age of 12, Sadako was diagnosed with leukemia. She was given just one year to live. <laughs> go on, go on. I I'll be okay. Faced with free time while living in the hospital, Sadako took up origami. Japanese legend says that if you fold a thousand paper cranes, the gods will grant you a wish. By the time she died in October of 1955, Sadako had made over 1,400 paper cranes. Her spirit captured the imagination of people worldwide. In 1958, a statue of Sadako was unveiled on the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. Approximately 140,000 people in Hiroshima died from the atomic blast. Sadako Sasaki became a symbol for all of the innocent lives lost during World War II. WHY THE HELL AREN'T YOU CRYING, YOU HEARTLESS PSYCHOPATH?! Crash, I wrote the script. I've seen all of the information already. <laughs> okay, tell me what. You go to the bathroom and pull yourself together, and I'll do the next video on my own, okay? Oh, he's already gone. Anyway guys, this next video is called Ota Benga, the man who is kept in a New York zoo. Can you believe we once put humans in zoos? 
In the 1800s, colonial exhibitions of newfound races were a popular attraction. One of the most famous exhibitions was in 1906 at the Bronx Zoo. Otabenga, a pygmy from the Congo, was put on display with an orangutan. Uh, am I hearing this properly? Slavery in the US had been abolished 43 years earlier. So there was some public outcry. Understandably. But attendance at the zoo doubled. God damn it! Bengo was required to perform daily displays of archery. Bones were scattered on the ground to make people think that he was a cannibal. He was billed as the missing link. Oh, for fuck's sake! Finally, after 20 days in captivity, Bengo was released. He spent the next 10 years of his life trying to adjust to American society. In 1916, he took a pistol and shot himself through the heart. Just, just get the next one started before I start crying like a little bitch again. This one is entitled, The United States Dropped Four Nukes on Spain, Accidentally. Imagine if nuclear bombs were being flown above your head 24-7. And then those planes crashed. Thanks, but no thanks. Just that happened during the Cold War. This created the most radioactive town in Europe. In the 60s, the US often had planes in the air that carried nuclear bombs. In 1966, a B-52 bomber carrying four bombs crashed while refueling mid-air. Three of the bombs crash landed into Palomares, Spain, with two of them exploding on impact but not detonating their nuclear cargo. The fourth bomb... Yes? ...could not be found. Oh. Soon, hundreds of boats were looking for the lost cargo. The search took 87 tenths days. One fisherman saw the bomb enter the water and aided in the search. They found the bomb 5,000 feet down with the help of Elvin, the same boat that found the Titanic. After the disaster, the radioactive cleanup was never completed. Today, Palomares remains the most radioactive town in Europe. That one was more terrifying than it was saddening. Hey, congratulations for holding yourself together this time, Crash. I'm impressed. Really? No. This final video clip is called The 8 Worst Jobs Kids Used to Do. Let's jump right into it. Number 1. Castrato. To maintain the voice of an angel, boys with singing talent were castrated before puberty. Number 2. Loblolly. This job put kids below the deck of a ship. Their job was to care for the sick and assist doctors during operations and amputations. Number three, chimney sweeps. Due to their small size, kids were the best option to clean coal and soot from chimneys during the Industrial Revolution. Number four, rat catchers. Once a kid graduated from chimney sweep, chasing rats was the next best thing. Honestly, I would much prefer to chase rats. That sounds like a thrill. Right. Number five, newspaper boys. The newsboys sold the papers on the streets of the big cities. They were made up of mostly orphans and runaways. Number six, matchstick dippers. Kids handled hazardous materials like phosphorus while working in matchstick production factories. Number seven, mule scavenger. Small children were tasked with cleaning machines, mules, while they were still running. Number eight, powder monkey. In the midst of battle, whilst the adults aimed the cannons, kids would pack them with gunpowder. Today, 168 million children are affected by child labor. 85 million kids work in hazardous conditions. <laughs> A massive thank you again goes out to Interesting Shit for letting us use their videos. Their channel is linked in the description below, so please check out their work if you enjoyed what you saw today. Believe it or not though, their content isn't all depressing. Culture just chose these ones. For some reason. And I can't believe he said shit twice in one video. Hey Crash? Yeah? Shit. Three times in one video! I hope you guys learned something from this video, and we'll be back with a new one next week. See you then. Follow Culture Crash on social media!